Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Raphael Bostic. I'm, the prof I'm a professor in the Price School of Public Policy and the director of the Bedrosian Center on Governance and the Public Enterprise. And I'd like to welcome you all to uh, our first uh, Leading from the West se speaker series. So um, just as a little background, I, this is supposed to be the background section for today. Um, I am here and, and leading the Bedrosian Center uh, coming from three years in Washington, uh, working in the Obama administration as an assistant secretary. And I'm an economist by training, and so I spent basically all of my time um, thinking about how do you design policy to make it work, um, thinking that that's the, the major hurdle. Well, you, I got to Washington and found out that there were some other hurdles. Um, and, uh, um, well, that's a, see, we've got the peanut gallery here in the front. Um, and, and the more I was there, the more I thought that um, important barriers were around the implementation of policy. So can institutions actually do what we want them to do? Uh, and uh, leadership issues. So are uh, visions being projected clearly enough? Uh, the staff understands what's going on. And then the rules of the game, this is the politics and who has authority and who doesn't, uh, and all of those issues. So I came back and uh, mentioned this to the dean, and he said, well, well I think we got something for you to do. Uh, and that was uh, try to do some things with the Bedrosian Center. So the center itself is focused on issues around the implementation of policy, uh, to try to make sure that our institutions are able to deliver policy um, whatever the policy is that we're trying to do in the most effective and efficient way. Uh, and we're trying to do that in three ways. First, uh, because we are at one of the leading uh, research institutions in the country, uh, we fund uh, research uh, by our faculty and others uh, to uh, really expand the frontier of what we know about how to implement effective policy in terms of public administration, in terms of leadership, uh, and in terms of policy design. So that's an important thing, uh, first and foremost, that we do. A second thing that we uh, try to do is increase the capacity of institutions themselves. And so uh, I've been working with Frank Zaranian, who is another professor here. And Frank, you want to wave your hand for the crowd? Uh, Frank is, uh, he is a, a sitting mayor at Rolling Hills, and he also teaches in the Price School. Uh, and we are really working hard to expand uh, our executive education programs, including local leaders programs where we train uh, electeds and, and leaders of special districts. Uh, and we are uh, looking to expand that uh, both domestically and internationally because uh, what we've found is that the issues around implementation and leadership aren't just US issues, they're issues, they're, they're basically humanity issues. Uh, and if we can uh, provide value added, we want to do that as much as possible. Uh, and then the third way that we are trying to uh, advance the implementation of good policy uh, is to uh, engage in conversations with the public directly. Uh, we have uh, had a number of uh, uh, speeches, uh, panels, and activities uh, around uh, implementation of policy. I would just mention two of them in addition to this. One is a series uh, that we call St uh, Students Talk Back. We do this jointly with the UNRWA Institute uh, for Politics and the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute. Um, that's every Wednesday uh, from 11.30 to 1. And we try to touch on various issues of implementation of policy. This semester, we've done sessions on social justice and how USC relates to its neighborhoods. We've done uh, an issue on gun control and homeland security, national security, uh, to try to highlight um, the issues there and how governance plays an important role on that. And we've also done one on communications and the intersection between communications and effective implementation of policy. All of them, I've moderated, so I thought they were great. Um, <laughs> but they are also available on, on our website, bedrosian.usc.edu. You can go look at them um, and, and take away what you will from them. Uh, I think that they are all very interesting. Um, the second thing that we've done is We've asked uh, members of our advisory board to have a, a, some more intimate conversations. We call them a lunch with a leader. Um, we've had um, Greg Smith, we've had Austin Butner, and we've had Yvonne Burke 
all uh, have uh, lunches, and these are 15 to 20 people in a room, and this is unstructured, uh, where we just have a conversation with the leader, get their perspectives on leadership, on the policy issues of the day, and how uh, governance and implementation uh, is uh, either helping or hurting in that process. And we will have another one soon. Um, well, we'll have a couple more soon through the semester. I wanted to just hi uh, highlight well, one member of our advisory uh, board membership who is here, and that's Ron Loveridge. Ron, um, he is the former mayor of Riverside, longtime leader in the Inland Empire. Uh, we are delighted to have him, and he will actually be speaking. Uh, we'll have a conversation in uh, the Students Talk Back series a week from tomorrow. Uh, so you all should come and, and listen to me and Ron talk about his experiences in managing a city that's gone through significant changes in the time that he's been uh, in, in the leadership. Uh, there's one other event that I wanted to mention, which is happening tomorrow. Um, this is also in the Students Talk Back series, and it is a conversation around education reform. Uh, Michelle Ree will be here, um, and uh, you should definitely join us for that. I should also say, Michelle Ree, you know, she's national, uh, extremely controversial, has been, uh, depending on who you talk to, very effective or not effective at all. Um, and, but we also have Ben Austin, who is an executive director of uh, the Parent Revolution. And parents clearly are an important component uh, to effective education. And so having them together should be uh, a very interesting discussion. We have two students talking as well, uh, representatives from uh, College Democrats and College Republicans, just to make sure that we have some balance there. Should be a great session, so I would invite and encourage all of you to join us for that. Um, and so, I was only supposed to talk for five minutes. I think I've gone over. I'm going to make sure that I don't get yelled at too much. So I'm going to turn the podium over now to my boss. Um, uh, Jack Knott is the dean and the Piper chair um, here in the, the Price School for Public Policy. Um, I like to take credit for him being here. Uh, as um, I was on the search committee, and I was the one who was tapped to give him the first contact uh, with USC. Um, and it was so good, he decided to take the job. Uh, but in the, t in the years Jack has been here, um, he has been a tremendous leader. Uh, we've seen the school really transform and increase the stature and prominence everywhere I go. You're like, boy, the Price School's doing a lot. Uh, it's now the Price School, which is something new that we are all excited and very proud about. Um, and Jack, I just want to thank you for all your leadership. Uh, and the energy that you've brought to this program and all the support for the Bridge Ocean Center. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming Jack Knott. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Raphael. Um, and thank you for that great phone call we had uh, eight years ago. <laughs> Uh, Raphael uh, really did a phenomenal job as Undersecretary for Policy uh, in the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, you can get a little glimpse of that just by looking at their website and seeing all the information and analysis that they have there and the new programs, et cetera, and a lot of that has to do with the leadership that Raphael provided in that department during a very difficult period. So uh, we're pleased to have him back. Uh, and very pleased that he agreed to uh, become the director of the Petrosian Center for Governance. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, it's the, the mission of the USC Price School for Public Policy is to improve the quality of life for people and their communities. And so it's my great pleasure uh, tonight to be able to introduce a leader who has advanced this simple yet very noble mission. Tonight we have the opportunity to have a conversation with Richard Reardon, uh, who's had broad experience both in the public sector and also in philanthropy, and will bring, I think, incredible insight into effective governance. Uh, mayor Reardon was mayor of Los Angeles from 1993 to 2001, and he brought innovative ideas to the city, and he focused on three really important issues. And one was public safety. Uh, a second had to do with uh, high quality jobs and economic development. And the third had to do with education reform, all extremely important issues in the city. And he also called for the creation of a citywide system of neighborhood councils 
to give neighborhoods better voice in that university governance system. And, and that's a, uh, the neighborhood councils is a system that some of our faculty have actually spent a great deal of time being involved in and studying over the years. And then in 2003, uh, Governor, then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger asked uh, Mayor Reardon if he would become Secretary of Education in the state, and so uh, he became California's uh, Secretary of Education. But beyond his career as a public servant, he's also been a major uh, distinguished philanthropist uh, in the city, uh, particularly in the field of education. I'd like to mention some of that philanthropy. He was the founding member of the acclaimed Learn School reform effort and was the founding board member of Los Angeles' best, Better Educated Students for Tomorrow, an after-school program helping thousands of children in underserved neighborhoods. In 1981, he created the Reardon Foundation aimed at helping teach all children to read and to write. The foundation has distributed more than 21,000 computers uh, to 2,100 schools in 40 states and enabled the pur purchase of 128,000 books for elementary uh, classroom libraries, really a remarkable achievement. And presently, uh, Mayor Reardon is the chairman of the Inner City Education Foundation, a consortium of LA public charter schools. In his addition to his work with uh, aiding young students, he co-founded the Reardon Scholars Program and the Reardon Fellows Program at UCLA, which served high school students, college students, and recent college alumni. And I do want to mention that despite uh, Mayor Reardon's affiliation with that other university across town, we enthusiastically invited him to this forum, showing our great Trojan hospitality. Um, actually, <laughs> actually, uh, we are welcoming Mayor Reardon back uh, because he visited the Price School a couple years ago uh, and gave a round table with us, uh, with uh, Steve Soberoff, actually, uh, in the, the uh, Dean's Conference Room. Uh, Mayor Reardon holds uh, degrees from Princeton, Uni Princeton University and the University of Michigan Law School, and he's a partner at Bingham McCrutchen uh, Law Firm, and he also uh, is a veteran, uh, bravely served our country in the Korean War. So please join me in welcoming Richard Reardon. Jack, would you do me a favor? Uh, sure. Never refer to me as a philanthropist. Okay. If you get the Oxford Unabridged Dictionary, it defines a philanthropist as somebody who gives back to the public a small percentage of what he stole from the public. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what term do you prefer? Just an ordinary guy, I guess. <laughs> okay. Do-gooder. So okay. we'll remember that, like that. We'll, we'll remember that for, for last time. Um, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. And just for the benefit of everyone else, this is really going to be a conversation. We're not doing speeches. Uh, really just want to talk through uh, some issues. And, I, and what I thought I, I would do to start, you know, this is called Leading from the West, right? And um, I guess there are two, two ideas there. One is leading. And what it takes to be a leader and what does leadership mean? Uh, and, and how did you approach it in, in your career? Well, I teach uh, three months a year at UCLA in the business school, and I teach about leadership. And there are four or five axioms of leadership. Number one is courage. And courage can be a lot. Like Teddy Roosevelt said, the world does not belong to the brilliant critic, but belongs to those that stumble, fall, get bloody, get up and keep going. Or another corollary is, only a mediocre person never makes a mistake. But courage, courage to make decisions, of course. Next is caring or giving. Caring for everybody you meet, from the janitor to the president of a corporation, and learn from them. You can learn from everybody you ever meet. Third, which is something that elected officials don't seem to understand is empowering others. This is so important that you empower people because you can't, I can't run 42 departments of the city 
without people around me. And I have to empower them, empower them to make mistakes, to, to get things done. And it worked beautifully. If you empower people, the other thing is you'll attract better people around you. And the next one is relentless pursuit of goals. Be a closer, get things done. And then a fifth one, which I may or may not add, is a sense of humor. <laughs> Most great leaders have a sense of humor, but can you teach somebody that? And of course, great humor is self-deprecating. I teach my students the one phrase to say, I couldn't agree with you more. No matter what somebody says to them, they say, Raphael, you're ugly and stupid. His I answer, agree with you his more. answer is what? <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. Right, I couldn't agree with you more. Right. <laughs> I'm a quick, quick study on this. Um, no, is it, you know, it's interesting that you say that because uh, in my time at HUD, um, one of the phrases I said more than anything else was, "You can't make this up," right? And you have to find ways <laughs> to laugh when things are at their right. hardest because it allows everyone to just understand that it's okay, we can be people, you're, you're gonna get through, and it'll be all right, and we'll get through together. And, and that's actually a, a really interesting thing um, that, that I think people don't talk about enough as an important component of, of being a leader. Right. So, um, so you did all of this, you, so you had this perspective on leadership, um, and, and in Jack's uh, introduction, he left out a whole bunch of other stuff that you did, right? And in, oh, man. in particular, the your your private sector uh, success. And it's so not true. None of that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so you you you've been wildly successful as a businessman, um, and yet you decided to turn into the political space. And and wh why would you do that? I mean, why? Would you, well, I've always been a problem solver all my life. As a kid, some re reason or other, people were attracted to me to help them solve a problem. The waiters at the club I belonged to would come to me if they had problems. And the city of Los Angeles was having gigantic problems in the late 1980s. They had the first major recession in the history of LA. They had the Rodney King riots. The national media had sold L.A. down the river, saying Los Angeles is an ancient city, it's behind us, it'll never be good again. <coughs> and I felt an urge to try to save the city. And my partner, Bill Wardlaw, who is a great, great political expert, came to me and said, why don't you run for mayor? And I said, well, it's three to one Democratic, that's a, I have a little... He says, don't worry, we'll get you elected. And he did get me elected. <laughs> My model was tough enough to turn LA around. And even though I wasn't very tough, we sold the public on that. <laughs> and uh, I was elected and I applied like empowering people. I empowered virtually everybody around me. I wasn't gonna second guess them. They could go and do things. I told them, do not think what the mayor is going to want or how I'm going to make the mayor look good. You think, when you come to work in the morning, what is in the best interest of Los Angeles, and then do it. And then secondly, I got people in the private sector, like Eli Broad, Steve Soberoff, Bruce Carrots, <coughs> and a bunch of others and empowered them, I, I not, I'd never, not just to be advisors, but to actually do things. Like Disney Hall, Eli Broad made it happen. He didn't, didn't just advise me, he literally went out and made it happen. Soberoff did the same thing with Staples and the Alameda Corridor. Bruce Carrots with Camp, I think it was Camp Hollywood or one of these that burned down. And it's amazing. If you give people the power, particularly on the outside, they can do things in half the time and for a third the cost that bureaucrats can do it. So, uh, we don't, do we have those people today, like a, a Soberoff or a Broad type that would engage like that? 
Oh yeah, you have because <laughs> the mayor has a lot of people that he gets advice from, he talks to, but he never asks them to do something. It's not in his genes to do that. And I don't know whether it's fair for me to criticize him on it because he didn't grow up in business or things like that. But the, like Jimmy Hahn, who was the mayor after, right after I left office, came up to me about a year ago at a party and he said, you know, Reardon, you knew all these wealthy people that get to do things. I didn't know any of them. That's why I couldn't get them done. But the mayor of LA is a very prestigious job and he can call up anybody in the city and they'll listen to him. And so you just have to learn to ask. You have to ask, right. So now, when you got elected, uh, did you have, how did you, how did you go about building your team? Right, what did you think you needed to have as the essential element so that your administration could be effective? Well, you, for, I mean, you, for, in LA you have to have a rainbow of people, particularly on commissions, where they have political power of sorts. And you have to do that. But the one important thing we realize is to make the president of every commission a very strong person. And even though we may be trying to make sure that uh, there's an Irish man on that commission who's not very bright, um, that uh, he won't do any harm because there's a strong president of the commission. I've got, I've got a, let me change subjects a little bit. Um, people ask me, what, is, what am I most proud of? Or what do I remember the most as mayor? And I suppose the Northridge earthquake should be. But I always remember going to small neighborhood committees in the inner city. And I remember going to one in the African American community and them yelling and screaming at me, uh, what are you going to do about the trees that are overhung, the graffiti that's all over the place, cracks in the sidewalk, the drugs that are sold out of a drug house, the prostitutes on street corners? And what do you think my answer was? I couldn't agree with you more. No. <laughs> <laughs> my answer was nothing. I can't help you. You have to help yourself. I'm going to empower you. You do things. Don't worry about whether you violate laws because it's much easier to get forgiveness than to get permission. Just if it's something that's ethically right, go ahead and do it yourself. Don't wait for the city months or years to get it done. And this one community called me back about six months later. By the way, I ended up always giving them my home telephone number, which none of them ever called me, but they, I gave it to them. But about six months later, this one community in the African-American area asked me if I'd come back and see what they did. I came back and the thing was magic. All the graffiti was gone, the trees were trimmed, cracks were taken care of. They got rid of the prostitutes by having the mothers walk circles around the prostitute. And, and then I'm just about to leave and I said, how about the uh, drug house? And the guy looks at me with a little tiny smile on his face he said, Mayor, that burned down mysteriously the day after you were here. <laughs> well, that mystery will endure, I'm sure. Um, so so I, I wanted to sort of turn to uh, the, the mayor race that we have today. And uh, in about four or five months, we will have a new mayor. In two weeks, basically, we will know who the two final candidates are. And I wanted to, to ask uh, a couple things. One. Uh, Thinking about June, you come out for June, um, this mayor is going to face a lot of things. Uh, what would your advice be to them in the things that they should try to be tackling or, or the, the highest priority issues? Well, the highest priority, of course, is to surround yourself with strong people so that when you become mayor, you can get these things done, you can implement them. It's easy to talk about public policy, but implementing it is not so easy. And this is where I'm, I'm going to back off in a minute. A month after I become mayor, became mayor, I met with the fashion industry leaders. The first of a bunch of meetings I had with 
you know, people like the fashion, other industries. And at the end of the meeting, two of the people came up to me and they said, you know, our customer cars behind the fashion mark are being towed away even though it's not a major street. And can you do something about it? So when I got out of the meeting, I ran into Bill Violani of my staff. And I said, Bill, go to the Department of Transportation, get me a plan to get rid of tollway signs. So a week later, he comes back with a 50-page plan that showed how you could get rid of tollway signs in five to eight years. And I said, well, I'm the business mayor. I was voted as a businessman. Get me a simple plan. And I forgot about it. A month later, I saw Bill, and I said, Bill, hey, where's that simple plan of getting rid of tollway signs? He says, taken care of, Mayor. Is it on my desk? Mayor is taken care of. I said, what do you mean? He said, my son and I went out the next night, and we took the signs down. <laughs> <laughs> and that came to me. My favorite motto was, it's much easier to get forgiveness than permission, so just do it. So I'm going to remember that. Um, so I, yeah. next, time, next time I have a parking frustration, we're just going to come out and take that. No, it, it, I, I have to say, um, I, I really like the phrase, it's, it's easier to ask, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. If it's ethical and practical. Yeah, I'll add that on. I'll, yeah. I'll go with that. Um, um, because particularly in the public sector, the rules and the bureaucracy Everything is slanted towards saying, no, yeah. don't do this, <laughs> don't get it done. You say yes, you've got to do a lot of work. Exactly right. And so nobody wants to say yes. But if it's already done, and yeah. it worked, and things are better, then people will clamor to take credit for it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and so, and so um, if good ideas should be embraced, then just yeah. go do them and don't worry about signing off and all those things. Um, t I want to talk a little bit about um, the role of the unions in Los Angeles and in, and in urban um, cities across the country. Um, how did you deal with the unions, and could you take that approach for dealing with the unions and apply that today? I mean, ha has it changed very much? Changed dramatically. When I was mayor, the heads of the unions, most of them had been there a long time. They were very savvy. I, I could get along with them, even though they didn't support me. I got along very well with the heads of the unions. And like, for example, I did, once a month I'd do the job of somebody in the city. And one time I did the job of picking up garbage. And I found out that the garbage trucks had been, uh, the, the, you know, what do you call them? Techno technologically much more efficient than they used to be. And yet the, the drivers were paid for eight hours a day even though they did their work in three or four hours today. So I talked to the union of that, and because of that, we saved about $50 million a year in picking up garbage. And so it was this type of thing that I could deal with the union on. Uh, James Wood, who was head of the AFL CIO, a typical thing, he called me up <coughs> late one night at home, and he says, Mayor, tomorrow morning we're going to have. 500 union people with signs asking you to resign as mayor. And tomorrow at 4 o'clock, we're going to have a press conference where, you, where my people cheer you, and you and I hold our hand up high and say we've made a deal, on whatever it was. But it was that type of attitude to get along on. Today, the unions are so strong, and they don't listen to anybody. And you take the pensions. The pensions, the worst, the persons that are going to be hurt the most on the pension problem are the city employees. Because the money isn't going to be there when they retire, particularly if they're young employees. The unions should be sitting down and looking for changes in the pension plans that make it work. They do that in the private sector. In the private sector, 85% of the companies that have unions have 401k plans. In the city of LA, they have zero, with one minor exception, which I won't bore you with. And the 401k, the employee owns that lock, stock, and barrel. 
Nobody can take it away from him, the money he puts in. And so the unions elect everybody. They put huge amounts of their money into the elections. And essentially, a vast majority of the city council and the mayor have been elected because of the unions. Now, do you think uh, you weren't elected because of the unions, though? <laughs> no, but <coughs> interesting enough, Bill Wardlow got along with the unions. Even when I was running, I got along with the unions. Even though they supported my opponent, they didn't go very far. They gave him very little money. And they do much more money now. Oh, infinitely more. Now, is this related, do you think, to uh, changes in f campaign finance rules, or have the unions just gotten more engaged? They've gotten more engaged, and <coughs> they realize that they control things any way they want. And right now, for example, they'll make a change in pensions. They'll give up a penny in pensions, provided you agree to give them three cents three years from now. They always come out ahead in the negotiation. So um, LA has a big pension obligation now. And it's growing you know, by leaps and bounds. Um, and I, I would say the, the LA pension issue is not unique to Los Angeles. So I was in Chicago a couple of months ago. They have exactly the same thing. And the Chicago folks think they're about a year ahead of where LA is in terms of facing the actual obligations. Um, what should be done? Should any, can anything Well, let's be? take it. When, when I was mayor, when I stepped out of office in 2001, we had zero unfunded liabilities of our pensions. Today, the unfunded liabilities are $11 billion, going up a billion a year. Back in 2002, the city put $225 million into pensions. This last year, the year that we're in, 2013, they put a billion two into it. In 2017, they're going to put two to three billion dollars in it. And I won't bore you with the reasons there's such a man, but they'll only have enough money for pensions, police, and fire. Everything else in the city will close down from street repairs, libraries, parks, etc. And somewhere in this, the people will stop buying government bonds. And at that point, the city won't have the money to fit, pay the employees of the city, particularly those out of the police and fire. And that's going to be the tipping point where the city declares bankruptcy. And the bankruptcy laws seem, there's a big fight over it, but you have Stockton, San Bernardino, Vallejo, and others in California. The judges seem to think that they have the power over pensions. So they can reduce the amount of pensions that people are getting. And yet, the unions can come up with better solutions than that if they get reasonable. And so if you're going to, for example, change what's going on, you're going to negotiate with the unions, not the po political people in LA, because the political people in LA have zero power. So, so who should be doing that negotiating with the unions? Is that the mayor? Is it the council? Well, is it a third? Is it, is it the business leaders? I think it's uh, people who the mayor appoints to do it. Somebody like myself, like. Uh, uh, Mickey, I think, I'm trying to think of uh, Mickey, who's Kit Clinton's top person, I forgot, but there are a lot of good people that they can appoint to do it. Canner. Pardon? Mickey, Mickey Canner. Mickey Canner, who's a brilliant, right. And uh, these are people that can make things happen, and the, 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 but the mayor has to stand behind them. As far as the city council, the, fact, the city council is so embedded with a, a vast majority controlled by the unions, people that can't think for themselves. So um, I want a related question that's not exactly related, which is the issue of term limits. 
Um, you were instrumental in the introducing term limits at the mayoral level. Um, do you think, how, how do you, how, what's your take on how that's played out? I want to forget I did that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was the biggest mistake in my life. And I thought you'd have, instead of having crooks like Willie Brown and uh, people like that. We're going to try to get Willie here one day to, he'll, to, to defend himself on that. But well, I'm going to defend him right now. Instead of that, we get bright young people that have come out of the college and they're, only, they're going to stay in politics for a few years and they're going to do what the city needs. What it's done is gotten uh, people who have had no experience in government or anything else and they make their total living the rest of their life on some political basis. And I, right now, I appreciate the Willie Browns. Willie Browns, whatever you want to say about him, was a great, tough leader. And if something was totally stupid, he's, he kills it. Because I remember once I called up Willie and I said, Willie, I'm sending some of my staff up to Sacramento tomorrow morning. I want to talk to you about AB 489. Uh, bill, and uh, like them to meet with your chief of staff, and if you have a few minutes, you can say hello. And he said, Reardon, you're wasting my time. Are you for or against it? I'm against it. Well, it's dead, so don't waste your time. <laughs> and it was dead, and never, you know, and that's the way he think. He, you know, and because of that, I was loyal to him politically. He was loyal to me. And we don't have that. You don't have that now. So, um, so is. Do you have any hope that, or would you push to ease the term limits, get rid of them, or? Well, I have. I mean, I was a major supporter of extending the term limits to 12 years from eight. Right. But the, the people like term limits for whatever reason. Well, maybe we should try to get them to get a more rounded perspective on them. Yeah, let's I, I, have the good, how about, Sherry, what do you think? I agree with you. You do? Whatever, yes. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, I think uh, I was the one who wrote before term limits came into being that what has happened would happen. What can I say? So Sherry, Why did you tell me I was wrong? <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> so that's, that's Sherry Bebbitz, Jeffy. She's also on our faculty, a tremendous uh, political uh, reader, reader of the political winds. And, uh, an advisor to many in Los Angeles about uh, political issues. Um, and I have to say, I... the um, mayor. <laughs> term limits has never been one of my favorite things. You know, I feel like citizens have a small number of obligations. One of them is to elect people, and if you don't like who you elect, vote them out. Right? Yeah. And if someone's doing a good job, you know, I, I don't want to get rid of them. I don't want to get rid of those people. But, but anyway, um, um, Another innovation, and, and, and you, I have to say you're, you're extremely interesting in that you did a lot policy-wise, but you also did a lot in terms of the rules of the game, right? And so the term limits is one, neighborhood councils changing um, the ability of local areas to have a more coherent voice in the political process is also really interesting. Um, what's, your, what's your assessment of how that's played out? I'm not sure because what it has, it's added a new political element in certain areas. So the people don't know who to go to. They go to the city council office, do they go to the, the, the neighborhood groups. And you get some people that get very big headed about being head of these groups. And I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not right now certain whether it's gonna work or not. I'm glad it's there. I'd like to give it a little more time and then, you know, guess it. Sh Sherry, I saw you shaking your head. Now stand up and tell people. Well, about neighborhood councils? I think yeah. my yeah. young colleagues will kill me. <laughs> um, I, not, I think I agree with you that there are many in the neighborhood council movement <laughs> who believe they actually have power. And so it, 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 it winds up as being a roadblock and the same diseases that we see in city council, in elected leaders at the top, I see happening 
at that next round rung below. I call it the professional politicians <laughs> syndrome. Present company accepted. <laughs> so, so then I, you begin to believe that the laws of ordinary mortals do not apply to you. So I would say this. And yeah. you know so, so, best. So sure <laughs> <done. laughs> I, I, do, I do think that this is actually an interesting issue um, about empowerment. I mean, empowerment gets dangerous, right? Because empowerment actually means people have power. Um, and then it's a question of how they use that power. And maybe we like how they use that power. Maybe they become tyrannical uh, and create their own fiefdoms. And it can, it can cut both ways. This is actually not what I expected to happen in the segment of the conversation. Uh, but we, ha we do have some experts on our faculty, Juliet Musso and others who have studied these. And it occurs to me that maybe we want to have um, a reflection on neighborhood councils and what they've meant for LA and have they been a good thing or a bad thing that um, maybe we'll bring you back for. Uh, because I, th I think it, 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 it is an open question as to how this will play out. And that, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, I want to. Uh, one of the things I've been really interested in, um, coming from Washington, with the federal level, um, back to the city, which is sort of the local level, is how government plays out at the different levels. Now, you've seen government um, at the local level as a mayor for eight years. You were in Sacramento for about three years as a secretary of education. Could you talk a little bit about, <coughs> does Sacramento work the same way as LA? as the city, and what sorts of things did you have to do differently to be effective in the two roles as the secretary versus the mayor? I, I'd say this, uh, government is more effective at the low level. At the city level, you can get a lot more done if you're the right person. And that's because, why is that? People assume the mayor has a lot of power, even though he doesn't. One thing I preach is, assume power can be real power. You just, if people assume you have the power, act like you have it, and it's amazing. Nobody will second guess you. <laughs> and uh, in Sacramento, you have all these unions up there, and they will second guess you in a second. Um, also, I don't know what it is, but with Schwarzenegger, you know, I had the idea of, he loved vocational education because he, when he first came to this country, he went to Santa Monica Community College mm -hmm. and learned some. I don't know what he learned, but the. Um, <laughs> but he wanted to do it, and I said, "Well, okay. What we have to do is let's go outside the government and find. I'll help you find the right person to oversee vocational education, because most of it was totally." bogged down in bureaucracies. And I couldn't get him to do that. And it was such a natural for that reason. But and then, by the way, Washington, I'll go, if you go to Washington, a secretary of, of transportation, of energy, of whatever it is, has virtually zero power in Washington, D.C. All the power goes at the, to the White House. It's in the White House. And it's simply, I call these pimply-faced 30-year-olds who are around the president are the ones that have all the power. And fortunately, through Bill Ward Law and some of his friends, we knew that. We knew who to go to in the White House to get things done. So that is totally true. And, and, you know, Sherry, I, did you agree with me on that? I agree with you on everything. So, so, <laughs> so, so I, I will say, um, you know, I was an assistant secretary. My boss was the secretary, who is a cabinet level position. Um, the number of gatekeepers in the White House who could prevent a secretary yeah. from doing things was astounding. And um, they're nameless, faceless people. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they're really people who nobody knows. They don't go through any confirmation processes. There's a, there's a, they have to be vetted um, to make sure that they're paying their taxes and all that. But, Beyond that, it's, it's a very, very um, interesting process. Yeah. And, and I, I would say that you know, Washington, our founding fathers made it difficult to do things already. Right? They were worried about the king being a king. So they wanted to have lots of folks to, to stop, stop things. Um, but 
there are a whole lot more people to stop things than I think they even imagined. Well, uh, I mean, people who had been in government a long time and they were appointed Secretary of Transportation, they learned the best thing to do is go around the country, give speeches every place you go as if you have power. <laughs> well, the bully pulpit is important for sure. And, um, and I, I will say, it, but the other thing that, that struck me, um, which is, which is the, uh, to my mind, the appeal of higher levels of government is that if you set the, the environment right, um, you can allow local innovation to thrive and things can happen at a local level, which can be, you can touch a whole lot more people and let people yeah. imagine themselves. And, and so there's some hope there, even though you directly won't be doing th that work. Um, so I guess the, the, the last thing I wanted to do, and, and we'll open it up for questions in a moment, so you all should start thinking about it, uh, what you would like to, to have or bring to the conversation, is, um, well, I guess maybe two, two things. Well, maybe I'll do one, and then I'll save one for the end. Um, um, we, we call this, this series Leading from the West, and, and the reason we do it, or one of the reasons we do it, is because, um, particularly coming from Washington, <coughs> issues that come up in the West, um, how the West is living, um, doesn't always, it seems, enter into the conversation. So the Eastern est political establishment lives in the East and the West. I mean, do you agree with that, that perspective? And if, if you do, you know, what sorts of things might we do to get people to pay more attention to the Western issues, which in many ways are at the frontier of what the country is going to face? I mean, it's clearly that, and the people in the East have much more control over Washington than we have. I'd say, you know, uh, take a vote to uh, separate ourselves from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that would become our own country. <laughs> country, I'll be the uh, dictator, and you can be the Lord Executioner. <laughs> that, that works for me. I like to do that. <laughs> So, um, so, okay, so um, if you have questions, uh, you should please come up to the mic. Uh, two rules uh, for the road in terms of the question and discussion period. One, please introduce yourself so we know who you are. And the second is um, ask the question in a way in which you would like a question to be asked of you. So uh, we should try to be respectful and polite, um, not to avoid hard questions, but just try to to do it in a civil way. So yes. Hi, yeah, Paul Kovitch, Department of Political Science. Recently you were making an effort to try to get a ballot initiative to uh, reform the pension system in Los Angeles. Do you still have plans to do that? It failed the first time, but you weren't able to get enough signatures. Are you still planning on possibly doing that in the future? Um, not immediately, it got, I was very naive when I brought this up, not realizing that we couldn't get over 300,000 signatures in seven weeks. And it's not that it was a failure as such, it was a logistical failure, but it left us with the only the next time we could get on a ballot is June of 2014. And even then, it's a question legally whether the city council can put you off another year on it. But, and I think right now we are the best thing is to educate the public and everybody about how bad things are in City Hall and that it'll force them to know they're headed for bankruptcy. People that, instead of buying government bonds, when they see that the, that the bankruptcy courts put bubble, uh, government bonds below almost everything else, where theoretically they're on top of everything else, but as soon as the public sees that, they're not gonna be buying those bonds. As soon as that happens, bankruptcy uh, will happen. And uh, it's, it's a terrible situation, but you have to keep a close eye on Stock, Stockton and San Bernardino. For example, San Bernardino stopped paying CalPERS its, its share of pension money. Hi, um, I'm Taylor Wolfson. I'm an undergraduate at the Price School. I just have a question, I wrote it down so I won't forget, um, about 
You mentioned that you need to put strong people in leadership roles, and that's what you tried to do as mayor. How did you choose those people? How did you know that they were the type of leaders that you were looking for, those strong people? Well, <coughs> we knew a lot of people around town who had recommendations, and uh, Bill Wardlaw particularly and his wife were very involved, particularly in the Democratic Party. And even though I was a Republican, uh, like 80% of my deputy mayors were uh, Democrats, where the Republicans were mad at me because I wouldn't take some <coughs> stupid kid <laughs> into being one of my top jobs. And so we, you know, by and large, we got a very good group. But somebody says you hire slowly and you fire quickly. And if somebody didn't work, we got rid of them quickly. Thank you. And by the way, we had a lot of young people and they were great. <laughs> Michael Banner. And um, I was pleased that you actually empowered me when I got a time to hang around your office from 93 to 95. My question to you, uh, since you mentioned that in the time you took over, there was the catastrophe of the week, you know, between um, earthquakes, riots, et cetera. What would you, a curious question is, is if you were asked, what advice would you have given to a mayor in this city that was the mayor during the time of the greatest recession <laughs> that we've seen in most people's lifetime in this room? Hey, tell me, give me the last sentence again. What advice would, should you have given to, or would you have given to the mayor during this recession that we just had? I still didn't get it. So we, we just had this recession. Um, no. Were you talking with Antonio at the time through the last three or four years? Like what, what were you whispering to him, or what would you whisper to him <coughs> um, to help the city get through um, that recession? Um, for, you know, I think basically, first of all, be friendly to business. Make sure that people get permits quickly. When I was mayor, we upped it where 95% of permits could be gotten on the internet, or the equivalent of the internet. And uh, the worst was three or four months for bigger projects. And now we have a terrible reputation of being unfriendly to business. So businesses don't come to LA, they don't expand in LA. Uh, the number of jobs, LA, the, the number of jobs that were in LA in 2005 were 75%, let's see, 25% more than they are today. Uh, so I think it's just getting the brightest and best people. I had a business team. I got, we were mostly young MBAs, 25 of them. And any problem or anything involving business, they'd be out there. They'd be the interface between the mayor and the bureaucracy. Let me indulge with one more question. So since we're at USC and there's a lot of young people there, where would you tell young people to bet today with their human capital in terms of staying in Los Angeles? Where, where should they go? Yeah, what, what should they do? What kind of bets should they make? Well, first of all, I had a lot of the SC uh, students as interns and others. And uh, in empowering people, we empowered people very quickly. If they were full time, empowered them to get things done very quickly. But they better not make mistakes in doing it. And making a mistake, by the way, I should, that's, uh, that's not true. If they make mistakes, admit it with confidence. The worst mistake they can make is not doing something. Then we wouldn't tolerate that. But SC, by the way, we had great luck with the SC people. It's too bad you had a bad football team this year. <laughs> <laughs> just, just this year, just this year. <laughs> My name is Cliff Lightfoot. I was a vice president of this school. All I want Jack not to do is return my phone calls, okay? That's number one. Jack, here I am. So Please return my calls. Uh, here, you want my cell phone? <laughs> that's right. I'll, I'll ask for Richard's cell phone number so I can get a return call from <laughs> so, you. So do you have a question? Uh, Bedrosian 
was a dean of this school, which a lot of people don't know who are here tonight, so I hope uh, that is announced to them. Uh, my question for Mayor Reardon has to do with the local mayoral campaign that's going on. As a matter of fact, I heard the debate last night on ABC, and <coughs> a number of the candidates talking about the LA Unified School District. I'm bothered. I spent time in City Hall, Mayor Reardon, as I told you, in the CAO's office. So, so do you have a question? And there's a, there's a connection between the mayor and the LAUSD. But why are these people talking about doing governance in the school district when their first job is being mayor of the city of Los Angeles and fixing the potholes in the streets and fixing other things in the jurisdiction of the city of Los Angeles? That's my question. They're doing it because they think it'll get them votes. That's what they're saying because it, will, it won't work that way. You know, when they're elected, they will not be able to make a difference in education the way they're talking about. You have to back the right people on the school board and then get them to do the right thing. Now, let me mention on the listening to the debate, you have Eric Garcetti, very articulate, bright guy who's a Rhodes Scholar, I think. Um, and here is a guy that's saying he was responsible for getting rid of 5,000 jobs. Now, two thirds of them. They bought out. They paid them a good amount, more than they were making. The other third, or 1,600, that was lost. The Department of Water and Power is paying their salary, but they're back at their old jobs. They're being paid by the Department of Water and Power, and they're back at their old jobs. And to make it even more ridiculous, the unions at the Department of Water and Power are suing the city for stealing some of their pension money. Hi, I'm David Sloan. I'm a faculty member in the Price School, and I am not concerned about Dean Knott returning my calls. Um, you're you're Mary, afraid when he's called. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little bit too close. Um, what I was thinking, what I would like to add, I'd like to push Professor Bostek's question just a little bit, and I understand why you would give a somewhat flippant answer about California leaving. But I am fascinated by us being in the West. I grew up in upstate New York. You went to Princeton. There is a, there is a West that we both came to, um, that we became part of. And I'm wondering, how is the West part of you as a politician, as an entrepreneur, as a person who looks out at an America of today? and think about us leading the West, perhaps, or speaking from the West as a way to think about how we can imagine the future or the present of our nation. Well, I fell in love with California the day I got here, and it's a meritorious system where you did well based on how good you were, not who your family was or anything like that, which it was at that time true in New York. Though also, if you look, if California disappeared from the map, the rest of the country would be in a, a depression, total depression, because of all the new technologies, you know, 80, 90 percent of them were invented in California. And we did all kinds of amazing things. Right now, what we're doing is destroying what we started on. It's the wealthy are leaving, that nobody will bring a business into California or expand a business in California. Our state is in desperate shape. You have the environmentalists who make it very hard to build things here, and you have a terrible bureaucracy. So I'm, I'm, I cannot bet on California right now. Why am I still here? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick, right? Yeah. Hi, Giuseppe Roblino. Um, under, I'm part of the undergraduate student government here at SC, and I'm a freshman at the Marshall School of Business. Um, Two-part question. One relates to the private sector, and one relates to unions. 
Um, uh, you talked about being able to have a cooperative, when you were mayor, being able to have that cooperative relationship between you and business leaders and being able to get things done in uh, unconventional ways, if you will. Well, now when business is getting far more competitive and it's all about public-private pr uh, partnerships that are sp spurring up all over the place and sometimes in some cases um, it, the controversy with feed, uh, kickbacks and all of that, also especially relating in some counties the, the uh, the, uh, with the issue of, of, of speed checking cameras and all that, how are, uh, that's the first part of the question, how do you spur change when, for some business leaders, it may be more beneficial to just establish that um, private uh, public partnership for a set number of years without <coughs> having to have that relationship? And then the second part with unions, how do we deal with unions now? Because you said that they've changed just the way they operate. Well, first of all, when I delegated things to businesses. I didn't delegate them to businesses that wanted to get business out of the city. Like Eli Broad did, Steve Silverup, these people were, didn't make anything out of helping the city. And that's the kind of people I picked. Um, right now, you see so many of the people that are picked by the politician are people that give a lot to, uh, uh, for, for their campaigns to get reelected and people that want something from the city. They want contracts from the city. They want entitlements from the city. And what was the second question? Uh, unions. You said that unions have become well, more unions, complicated. They, I think they say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I think their power has corrupted them. It doesn't mean you can't meet with them and talk to them. I'm going to have dinner next week with the head of one of the unions, for example. You can talk to them, but when push comes to shove, they'll put a knife in your back. Thank you. Is that always true? Or is, is there, I mean, I mean, on some level, you know, one of the things that, that we are talk about or think about in Bedrosian Center activities is the idea that leadership is not just a public sector issue. Um, it's a private sector issue. It's a non-private sector issue. Uh, should we demand the kind of hard leadership from unions that we would of a mayor or a governor? I, I think you're right on that. I think I overstated myself there because I know uh, I met about three years ago with the heads of you know, the police and the fire and people like that and um, talking about the future of the city. And their attitude was like, all of a sudden, I talked about Austin Buettner, and they loved Austin Buettner, because they realized jobs, jobs, jobs had a big effect on how their members were going to be. As a fellow Princetonian, I wonder, do what you still- What class are you in? Pardon me? What class? I was two years behind you in the graduate school. You were 53, right, and great wrestler? No, 52. And a great wrestler? No, r rugby. I was All-American rugby. Oh, okay. Do you still ride your bike around Brentwood, and is that why you are in such fantastic <laughs> physical shape? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do ride my bike, yeah, all the time. I ride typically from Brentwood to Playa del Rey, go across Bologna Creek, and there's a little restaurant. We meet there on weekends and we solve all the problems of the world. <laughs> One additional, do you still buy loads of books and bring them home on your bike? Yeah, I'm a really serious addiction problem there. <laughs> That's a good one to have. Yeah. Sterling Franklin, I'm an alumnus of the school. It's my understanding that half the cost for all cities typically are police and fire services. My question is, why do we, and I've been a deputy sheriff, so I know a little bit about this, why do we allow policemen and firefighters to retire after 20 years of service? And the crime rate in that Los Angeles City keeps going down, yet we've recently raised the number of police officers to above 10,000. I realize that's good politics. We keep discovering in the newspaper that police officers are working on cold cases now. Don't we have too many police officers in the city of LA and probably too many firefighters? 
Well, I think you're right. And the again, it's the unions controlling things. And there are so many things, like you take a paramedic. A paramedic goes to a house. What is driving right behind the paramedic is a big fire engine. You don't need that. We, back in the 70s, uh, the city of LA put a lot of new uh, construction requirements in the, on the buildings. So essentially, we have very few fires on buildings in LA these days. Uh, we do have the brush fires, which fortunately haven't hurt LA, but we have to work with the other cities. But there's so many changes that can be done there. Also, 80 or 90 percent of firemen, when they retire, they declare they have disabilities. They get extra money that way. And it's on and on and on and on. So there's so, no solution, is there? So well, I was gonna, I was going to ask somewhere down the line there is. Right? I mean, the, this one is hard, right? So you know, nationally, and it becomes just in Washington. Any Democrat who would get up and say we need fewer police, right, is soft on crime. Yeah, right. right. And they're going <laughs> to get killed, right? And so what what's the dynamic whereby you can point out the abuses? and actually have that translate into changes in the level of resources that go there? You tell I'm me. I'm asking hard questions now. <laughs> if so. I knew the answer, uh, because you look at fire, I mean, police, and they are making tiny steps in this direction. Uh, so many of the jobs a policeman have can be done by a, a secretary or, you know, not a very high paid person. And by the way, the police are 70 or 80, Police and fire together are 78 or 80 percent of the of the budget. Hi, my name is Lisa Wong. I'm actually from the East. Um, I'm a pediatrician and a musician, and interested in um, the use of the arts to promote uh, STEM um, education K through 12, but also into the uh, graduate schools. My question to you is, I'm, I'm so grateful to you for all of the work that you've done with reading and writing across the country, and the question is what your um, uh, perspective is on the use of the arts in promoting uh, academic education. Well, I, with you, I believe that they help kids dramatically, and the kids are more likely to have, be much, do much better in their future. The problem is this word implementation. Everybody may agree with you, then do you, how do you implement it at the school? And they only have so much money, they've got to decide, are they going to have a football team, or are they going to have arts and performing arts, and this, that, and the other. So we find typically you need some wealthy person outside the system to implement it inside the school, like I'm head of these charter schools. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of that because we have uh, I forgot his name, Jackson, the uh, singer, uh, pays for it all. But is it integration or, or, or um, uh, can you integrate it into all of the different sciences and, and, and math rather than implementation? I don't see it is, there, is there an I, issue that you, way? You could, but I don't see it. And uh, right now, there's so little money into education, you have to think of you know, where we're going to use it. So just, just for the record, I'm from the East too. So um, I live that frustration uh, with everyone else. Um, we're getting close to the end of time. So if you, if you have a short question, I would encourage that. Um, I'm happy to ask more questions myself. Um, um, we didn't talk a lot about, um, I mean, when, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned um, the issue of the Catholic Church. And, and how the governance structure of the Catholic Church may have contributed to some of their challenges. Uh, when I grew up as a Catholic, and I'm still Catholic, I thought that the Catholic Church was the best run organization in the world. A holy, brilliant, God-given pope delegating to bishops who did to priests and others. And all of a sudden I realized, particularly with the pedophile problem, that the uh, church is as bad a bureaucracy as the state of California. Yeah. 
And for example, you may have read this in the LA Times, but I've seen this for years. In pedophiles, the cardinal in LA cannot remove a priest for being a pedophile. They have to by, go to Rome. Rule? What? By rule? They're, they're prevented? By, no, they have to get the permission of this bureaucracy in Rome. And by the way, the current pope was head of that bureaucracy for years. And if the bureaucracy may take a year or two to make a decision and all the, but you got the damn priest still there. And it's, it's a crazy, crazy system. And this is where, you know, if I were there, I would ignore Rome and just do it. <laughs> you would, you'd be an interesting cardinal. If um, you want to learn something, <laughs> what? You'd be an interesting cardinal, for sure. Well, I teach at UCLA Graduate School of Business, and I have uh, John Bacchus, who's head of the Greek Orthodox Church here, and uh, uh, well, I can't think of her name, uh, a woman at SC who is the expert in the country on pedophiles, talking to one of my, one of my class sessions. Yep, LA seems to be born, at least with the new charter, on kind of the Community Reinvestment Act. I'm glad Raphael is here, and some of the HUD districts and these low-income areas is major um, waves of census tracts to attract bigger money. But what, you're not, but what I want to find out is your look at the future ahead. We have a Chicano world in Los Angeles. You have what? Chicano world, Mexican. But the power in these neighborhoods are coming, it's still, you know, the days of Martin Luther King, the black power, but they're connecting with El Salvadorians who are stepping up as Latino powers. And we have Latino leaders now who don't really care about this uh, aspect of our community, which are, are born here, they're not immigrant here. So what, do you, what is your kind of vision of these different cultures that are well established, plus the immigrant ones they now have to put under their wing in addressing uh, Los Angeles? It's still run by a very few, I mean, you're one, wealthy people without turning to the electorate vote of these people and replacing it with nonprofits. So what's your vision of this? It's like a nonprofit world. Well, I think the leaders like myself, have to reach out to these people, bring them into government, you know, representative, and reach out to them. So and I did that, I did it very successfully. And, and I would just say one other thing, we, we are actually witnessing a transition in Los Angeles in terms of leadership. Half the council, uh, this is the term limit issue, actually works in this regard, in that we're about to have uh, seven new council members plus a new mayor. So now the new mayor is not totally new, but it, but it does provide an opportunity for some new dynamics to emerge in terms of the political environment. You know, if in, in the Hollywood district, we have 13 people running, right? That is a sign of a, of, a, of a significant amount of grassroots energy, and we'll see sort of how it shakes out in terms of what the election is, but I do think there's some potential <coughs> And this question, which is at the heart of what you're saying, does that really translate into empowerment in an increasingly uh, diverse demographic? Right, right. Plus, the, plus the nonprofit world's taken over these communities. I fight the non-public-private partnerships, whatever oh, they're in. So they're in more than the vote of the people. Okay, well, if you take Compton, for example, 90% of the children in the, in the elementary schools in Compton are Latino. And yet the government in Compton is all African American, virtually all African American. So complicated things are happening, but not happening as fast as some people like. Yeah, we were actually talking about this as well. So Janice Hahn is the representative for Watts. Right. That's right. She does not look like most of the people that live in Watts. Um, <laughs> and so there are some interesting dynamics about the the way that the public is collectively making these decisions, which I think we need to, to understand a whole lot better, which means I'll stay in business because we have to study these things. Yeah, right. so, that, so that's good. Um, we're just about out of time, so I wanted to um, um, ask two questions um, that have to do with uh, the next mayor. Uh, and the first is, if you had an opportunity um, 
you ran for, for mayor in 1993, 92, 93. Um, would you run again today? I would think of it, but I'd like to reach, look into it to see, would I gain the power today that I had back then? And probably not, I mean, to do it, but uh, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> and what I would do, like Vera Gosa, and by the way, he's doing some pretty good things in education. Now, I don't want to take everything away from him, but he is somebody who people around him, everything they do is what's going to make Vera Gosa look good. And he himself is, he goes through the opening of envelopes. And uh, <laughs> he needs a, uh, you know, somebody like myself to be his chief of staff for a year or so. And, you know, so to see that he can be loved more by doing the right thing. And then just one last uh, piece of prognostic. I guess this is a two-part question. One, of the, the major candidates, um, is there one who you would support? And then um, the second is, who do you actually think will win? Um, no, no. <laughs> I don't think I want to answer that. You sure? Just do it. No, I, no I'm supporting uh, Kevin James now. And uh, who is, at least he knows what's going on. He probably has no chance to get elected, but he, he's going up in the polls, so there's a slight chance. No, he's actually um, been, been surprisingly not the right word, he's been remarkably effective in the last month. Yeah. So, like his campaign has actually moved in an interesting way. Um, and the, there is a real wild card in that, you know, with the top two uh, rule and so many people running, you don't need 40% of the vote to get to the final round. You may need 18. Right. Right, and that changed the dynamic and it makes a lot of things yeah. um, uh, uncertain. So he has a chance, right? Uh, he certainly has a chance and, and everybody has a chance um, at this stage. I guess we don't, but, but, yes. uh, but others do. Um, I want to thank you uh, very much and, and uh, this has been exactly what I hoped it would be, a very interesting a conversation um, and a conversation, which is what I really like. I, I don't take back what I said about you. Oh, I, <laughs> I agree with everything that you said. <laughs> and I just wanted to, um, b before we go, go, um, I wanted to just point out a couple of things for takeaways. I like to have these things so that you, you leave with some ideas or thoughts on your mind um, that came up. Um, one is about empowerment and the idea that sometimes power means giving other people power and letting them do things, and that's how institutions can be effective. That's an important message, and, and it's one that, that you came back to uh, many times. Second um, issue that I actually really like, and I'm not so good at it, is the hire slowly, fire quickly, mm -hmm. right? Make some assessments about what's working in your institutions, always be thinking about how is the organization playing out and that, that's, that's, that's useful. Um, and then, then the, the one that uh, we talked about a lot early, which I really appreciate, is the just do it philosophy. Um, ask for forgiveness uh -huh. rather than for permission. And um, perceived power can be. Assumed power can equal real power. Yeah. That's exactly right. And the idea that um, there are lots of good ideas I told my staff this all the time. There are lots of good ideas. I, d I don't have a monopoly on them, um, but I also don't have time to fully implement all of them. So if you have one, do it. It better be a good idea. But if it's a good idea, um, I'll back you up. And that's the last thing I wanted to say, which you implied a lot, um, but is really important, which is the idea that um, the leader has to provide cover for their staff. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, if your staff is afraid of failure, then they won't do anything. And you need them to be out there and be willing to do things. Um, and then if they mess up and tell you they messed up, that's okay. And we'll come back for another day. Um, very good messages um, from someone who has, is an icon in Los Angeles. And it's, it's truly my pleasure to have shared the stage with you for the last hour. 
and hopefully we'll have you back, talk to neighborhood councils and other things. I want to thank all of you for coming. I hope you found this interesting. I want to thank everyone who asked questions, and uh, we will look for you at future Bedrosian Center and Price School events. Thank you, and have a great evening. <laughs>